Game 11 of the World Chess Championship. Before I get into this fascinating encounter, if you're not a subscriber, click that button. And if you want to support the channel, do check out patreon.com, Powerplay Chess, and there's all kinds of interesting things depending on how much you contribute per month. Free videos, opening articles, test game puzzles. Do check it out, patreon.com, Powerplay Chess. Right, let's get into this one. Yanni Pomnishi leading by a point going into this game. He was playing with white. Okay, a nice position to be in. And Ding doesn't risk anything. He plays his solid e5 and Nepo goes for the Spanish. And this is exactly the same as, I think it was game five. And Nepo goes for not the absolute main line with rookie one, but d3. And b5, because now there was, there was a threat to take on c6 and take the pawn pushes the bishop back, and d6. So previously, Nepo played in the match, Nepo played c3, but he goes for a3 this time. It's necessary to play one of these moves, otherwise black is going to exchange off that very important bishop. Now you could just castle here, that's the main move, but Ding goes for knight a5, pushing the bishop back to a2. Well, that doesn't seem like a big deal, puts the knight a bit offside, but the point is this, that it makes room for the pawn to advance to c5, which gives black great control in the centre. And both players have played in exactly this way before. Of course, there is a slight drawback with playing c5. It does weaken that d5 square. So you can see that these pieces have some control over d5. So bishop e6. I mean, this pawn structure reminds me very much of the Kalashnikov Sicilian or the Sveshnikov or the Nidorf, where that square, fighting for control of that square, is incredibly important. And you can see that is what Ding is doing by playing the bishop here. Because if white exchanges, then that pawn controls these squares. And that's a very chunky pawn formation. Black has a lot of control in the middle of the board. But bishop g5, played by Nepo, the idea is to knock that one out and then to occupy the d5 square. And that's exactly what happens. Carlsons, Carls, Carlsons, Carlsons, Bishop f6, Bishop f6, and Knight d5. I mean, you see this so often in the Sveshnikov, in the Kalashnikov. I mean, if you remove these pawns, then you would have exactly a Sicilian pawn structure. But the strategy is very, very similar. Black has the two bishops, but at the moment, particularly that bishop on f6, doesn't achieve too much. It would love to come to g5. Uh, that's problematic at the moment. Um, but g6. So that just makes room for the bishop to drop back to g7. So this bishop can come into the game quite effectively later on. And previously, Ding has faced c3 in this position, uh, but he got a reasonable position there. But queen d2 from Nepo, queen looks well placed here, looking down this diagonal, and looking at the knight on a5. So the bishop steps back to g7. So that, that's nice. The bishop is now out of the range of the knight. And... Yeah, white has gained a little something positionally by occupying this square, but this bishop covers very well. Knight g5, that's a good move. I mean, I think if white doesn't go for this, then in the long term, this can be quite pleasant for black, actually. You know, with, with moves like king h8 and potentially even f5 to start some, some action on the f-file. So I think this is a good idea 
to eliminate this bishop. And Ding said he was concerned about white breaking with f4. So, you know, in that case, this bishop can come into the game after an exchange. So he shut out this bishop with c4, of course, a very common idea in this kind of position. In fact, it is possible to bring the knight back to c6 because after f4, then knight e7, again, a very typical idea from the Sicilian defence, black is pressurising the knight on d5. So actually, that is playable for black. But c4, also excellent. Nepo decides to eliminate the bishop on e6 and then bring the knight back. So there's a bit of tension here. Black has to be careful not to resolve that tension too early, of course, because that would free the bishop. And there's potentially a bit of pressure on d6. I have to say that when I was watching the game, I thought Nepo would come out well from the opening. There are no real weaknesses in white's position, but there are weaknesses in black's position. That knight is somewhat offside. There's some pressure here. But also that seventh rank, that would make me feel a bit uncomfortable if I were black. So black certainly has a few problems to solve here. So I think a good outcome from the opening for, for Nepomnishi. Bishop h6. Well, that's a very important move. The bishop activates, and you see this in the Sicilian Kalashnikov all the time, where the bishop, well, usually comes out to g5 from one of these squares, and once it's on this diagonal, then that really helps black. And you can see, well, there's a, there's a bit of a pin here, which is nice. But still, white has some pressure. Rook d1. So introducing this idea to take on d6. So this is a bit uncomfortable for black, but Ding comes up with a very good move here. He needs to counterattack. And he played rook b8. Good idea. Well, it doesn't seem immediately obvious that this is a counterattack because the rook is uh, rather blocked by that pawn. But the point is that to make any progress here, white is going to have to exchange on c4. And of course, after one of these captures, either knight or pawn, well, at some point the b file is going to open. So there's counterplay against that pawn. And here, Nepo thought for about 10 minutes. And he decided to simplify with pawn takes pawn. He doesn't need to. He could have played queen e2. He realised this. And in fact, after the game, he rather regretted not playing this move. And black still has a few problems to solve here. The machine says that white is slightly better here. Well, all I can see is that it would be very hard for black to gain any advantage in this position, but black has to play accurately in order to equalise. So, first of all, having stepped out of this pin, then black... So this didn't happen, just to be clear, but black would have to exchange. And you can see there's still potentially pressure here. And also this queen might switch to the king side. So, for example, queen b6 looks sensible. I think this, this endgame would certainly be comfortable for black. But that queen could switch with queen g5 or queen h3 just looking at that weak pawn there rook f6 well there's potential to double on the f file as i said the computer thinks that that black is okay here but white still has a little bit of pressure um, by exchanging here and playing b4 so the queen defends here you see, it'll be white that decides when to exchange off on c4. Um, black is okay, but still a few problems to solve. So let's go back. But in this position, Nepo decided to cut.
cut for the end game. He exchanged here, knight takes, so bishop takes, pawn takes. Remember there's a pin here, so that knight can't take the pawn. Queen takes d6, and now we're going to get a mass liquidation. Exchange here, exchange here, and rook and pawn endgames are notoriously drawish, particularly when you have a lot of isolated pawns to attack. Nepper actually said he was that he thought he would get into uh, a three versus two endgame where he could play for a win, but actually there's not a lot going on here. King f2, yes, this pawn is going to drop, but actually Ding forces the king to a poor position. The king has to come back here to safeguard these pawns. And actually the king is just too far away to support this pawn. So king here, king f6. If king f3, then this... Well, in fact, you, you you can just capture here. I mean, this and that's that's going to be a draw. So I mean, there really is nothing here. So rook e8, king f7, and the players just repeated the position and a draw. Uh, the rook could go over here, but well. There really is nothing to play for in this position when it's two pawns against one. So Nepo didn't even bother with that. And let's just dot the I's and cross the T's. You can play here. King here. Yes, that would give, well, a few winning chances for white. Um, but yeah, there, there's no need to go in for that. Um, instead... Rook takes e4. I mean, this is very, very simple to hold for black. So, in this position, as I said, the play is repeated three times, which means that's a draw. Well, I think, in a way, that game suits both players. And uh, Pomnishi is a, a step closer to winning the title. Now he has only three games left. But for Ding, well, in those final three games, he now has two games with the white pieces, so he can try and press in, certainly in one of those games. Well, he tried to press in, in all three to try and get a win to, to level the match. Um, not a dramatic game, but I think we have to see this game in the context of the whole match. And it is an important game. And the tension just increases, which is great fun. Tomorrow, Tuesday, is a rest day. Game 12 takes place on Wednesday. And of course, Ding Liren will have white. Do join me then.